Uh, so that's the three parries, right? We've talked about the static parry, the hanging parry, and the B parry. We've gone through how to do them, uh, where you can execute them from, and how uh, Fiore uses them and how other sources use them. So we could end there, but there's one other way of parrying that we want to talk about that is a very influential strategy and technique that we start to see uh, grow at the with Fiore and then it becomes even more influential afterwards. So uh, that's the thrust, right? It gets a star because this is the three parries and this is the fourth. Obviously uh, we have to count like medieval people do. Uh, and also it gets a star because it doesn't quite follow the initial definition that we started with. So why is that? The answer is because the way you execute uh, the parry with a thrust is that in a single tempo you thrust in a manner which both it, displaces your opponent's attack and strikes them or threatens them with the point. Now obviously this violates our original description of parrying because one of the key components of that description was that you cannot also be threatening your opponent. Uh, again, that's why this is the fourth of the three parries. But it is in Fiore's text, it's worth talking about, uh, and it shows up, uh, continues to show up throughout history, as we'll see later. So, how do we do this? What does Fiore tell us? Uh, well, this thrust comes with a lot of names. Uh, Fiore calls it the exchange of points. Other systems will call it the stop thrust, or the single time thrust, or a thrust in opposition. Lots of people use it, so it's called a lot of different things. But these are names that you should familiarize yourself with, so if someone from a different system is talking about it, you can understand what they're trying to say. So let's talk about the exchange of points, see what Fiore has to say. He says, this is the exchange of points, and it is done like this. When your opponent thrusts at you, quickly advance your front foot off the line, and with the other foot, step to the side, also moving off the line. Crossing his sword with your hands low and with your point high into his face or chest, as you see drawn here. Also, he tells us, this is a cruel exchange of thrusts. In the art, a more deceptive thrust than this cannot be made. You attacked me with the point, and I have given you this, and I can make more secure it by voiding out of the way. So, like our previous descriptions, we get a, a descriptive and an evocative discussion on how to do this. Right? He tells us the footwork, we need to move off the line, but also forward. He tells us what to do with our hands, we're keeping our hands low, we're crossing the sword, we're keeping the, hot, the point high either at his chest or his face. Uh, we know that this is very deceptive, which Fiore uses a lot to describe actions you can take when your sword is forward, right? It is quick to execute, it is hard to see coming, uh, and it is very deadly when it actually happens. So that gives us an idea of what Fiore is trying to get us to do, right? Now what's interesting is that Fiore in his text <clears throat> only is only describing this as a counter thrust, right? He doesn't explicitly tell us that we can do this against the cut, uh, but there is a lot uh, of actions that you can do that still make sense when countering a cut in the same manner. So, uh, again, let's like I was saying, our original definition of what a parry is is protecting yourself from the blow in a so in a way that completely closes the opening, which we did. Uh, that was being attacked by your opponent, but does not allow you to threaten the opponent. Right? This is the kind of asterisk telling us, well, this doesn't really qualify, but it's still uh, we're still going to talk about it. So. The thrust parry does threaten while also crossing the line, doesn't match the original definition. Uh, from where can we execute this? 
Well, because we know this is a thrust, we know that we can execute it from any guard that can initiate a thrust, uh, which is most of them. Fiore tells us when we get into the guard descriptions, which guards can throw cuts, which ones can throw thrusts. Uh, almost any guard you're going to be able to initiate this technique from, uh, which is great. That makes it versatile and easy to deploy. We also know that because this is a thrust, we know it can be done from above or below, or the right side or the left side. I put inside and outside because that is the later terminology that we utilize for determining where you're executing this technique from. Here we can see him executing the technique from the left uh, with the spear. So what is our follow-up action? Well, ideally, we thrust them and they die, right? That's great. Uh, but what if they don't? Or what if they do? What are we supposed to do? Well, Fiori tells us that we need to continue to drive the thrust forward, regardless of if you hit or miss. And then from there, you need to execute a stretto play. Here we can see the follow-up to the exchange of points, where Fiori says, if I've missed, I keep going forward and I grab his hilt. Right. What this does is it allows you to stay safe. You put your point in, you move past their point, you stay safe from their counter thrust, and you're able to control them. Right? If you have run them through, it allows you to kind of stop them from going crazy or hurting you again. Uh, or if you've missed, say your point bounced off their armor, it's a great position that allows you to close and pull your dagger or make them submit via wrestling or something like that. The other follow-up action you can take is that if you land the thrust, uh, or also if you miss, you can step back out of measure, right? This is kind of our standard, my action didn't work, I want to reset the fight, you can always move back out of measure. So let's look at some of the other sources. Does it still exist? How are people using it? Well, of course, we always start with Tallhofer. Tallhofer has the exchange of points. Um, he, in this play, he tells us that as he's cutting, I just thrust at them and my hilt will lock out their blade, right? So exactly the same thing that Fiore is talking about, except I believe that Tallhofer explicitly says he's using it against the cut here. Uh, we also see this in the Lichtenauer tradition throughout all the various sources. Uh, this single time thrust uh, is very common through there. Uh, of course, once we get into uh, the Bolognese system, it's all over that as well. Uh, you can see the transition here that they show where we're going from Cotolonga Stretta into Guardia Entrade, right? This is very common. It is used both against as a counter thrust uh, or a thrust into uh, a cut as well. Same thing as what Tallhofer says, as they cut, I collect their blade with my hilt and I put the point in. We also see this in uh, some of the early, very early rapier texts, right? The As we approach the end of the 1500s, this is Palladini. He's discussing how uh, if he cuts or thrusts me from the right, I can thrust at his neck or his right shoulder, and I'll stay safe as long as I have good body mechanics. And of course, Fabrice, uh, once we get into Italian rapier, this concept is kind of the core fundamental basis of Italian rapier, is using your thrust at the right time and the right tempo to lock out your opponent's sword, whether it's coming from a cut or a thrust or whatever other action is happening. So, like the static parry became the cornerstone of the saber and backsword manuals for Europe, the uh, thrust parry, as we're calling it here, kind of becomes one of the core fundamental pieces of Italian rapier. So, that's it. Those are the three parries that Fiore tells us about. <laughs> The static parry, the hanging parry, the beat parry, and the thrust parry. 
Um, that's all I got for you guys. Um, and if you have any questions, we can dig into those. Uh, hopefully that was relatively simple. You can see how these pieces kind of fit into your toolbox of how to defend yourself and respond to different actions. Uh, and you can see that Fiore uses all of these throughout his text.